Today, we're going to be talking about Google cognitive abilities. And this is probably one of the most requested questions that we get in the comments on YouTube videos that we have on the pocket board channel. And um, I think the reason it gets asked a lot is that Google's cognitive abilities interview is not particularly well documented elsewhere on the internet. So, um, so today I wanted to dedicate this live session to focusing on GCA. We have a video on GCA interviews that's going to be coming out on the channel in the next couple of weeks but wanted to really answer any live questions about it. If you are listening right now and you have a question that's not related to Google Cognitive Abilities, feel free to pop your question in the uh, in the chat and I'll answer your questions uh, while we're going through or right after I finish going through GCA. First to get started, what is GCA? So GCA is stands for General Cognitive Abilities. And this is a specific interview at Google, and only Google does this interview, where it's focused on understanding the capacities of your brain and the actual cognitive abilities that you possess. It is a dedicated interview, which means you have a full 45 minutes in your final round interviews dedicated to understanding your cognitive abilities. And there is no kind of like star plus plus car behavioral framework that you can use for these. And the questions are all made up by the interviewers. So there's not like a question bank that you can look up online. So you can imagine, and also interviewers tend to ask a lot of follow-up questions. And this is all by design. So one of the things that I want you to understand if you're curious about GCA questions is that in order to understand the boundaries or the limits of any system, usually you have to test until you get to the limits of that system. So the GCA interview is designed to do exactly that. In order to understand your cognitive abilities, we need to get to the very end of your cognitive abilities, which means lots of follow-up questions, really bizarre question prompts that really get you thinking. Um, and, and, and for a lot of candidates, this can make people very uncomfortable. So today I wanna demystify GCA interviews. I wanna help you understand what you can do to prepare for them so that when you get a GCA question, you are not caught off guard. And when you get follow-up questions in a GCA interview, you're able to kind of keep your cool, focus on answering the question and understand that the interviewer is probing to find the ends of your cognitive ability. So you are going to hit the wall at some point and that's okay. Um, before we dive into how to go about answering GCA questions, I want to explain why Google asks GCA questions. So most candidates are used to interviewing companies where the company is trying to assess whether you have the skills and abilities to do the job that they're interviewing you for. And so they're trying, they're asking questions like, you know, have you ever managed vendors before? What is your experience dealing with uh, suppliers? How do you manage projects? Uh, or, you know, what coding languages are you comfortable with? But really job specific skills. And they're trying to understand how much you know already about that job and those job specific skills. Google doesn't hire for what you can do today. Obviously you need to be able to do the job that you're being interviewed for, but it's actually more important to them to hire people that are going to have the cognitive abilities, the, creative, the creativity, the uh, big thinking abilities. And then of course the synthesis processes to be able to help them solve problems that they haven't even thought of, product areas that they haven't even gotten into today. So in order to find those people and to see, uh, so four of your on-site interviews are gonna be dedicated to understanding what you know and what you're capable of doing today. But the GCA interview is all about understanding the limits of your potential cognitive abilities and what you might be able to help Google with in the future. So that is why it's a dedicated interview. That is why it's a full 45 minutes. And that also hopefully helps you understand that it is a factor in hiring. It is not the only factor, which is why you have four other on-site interviews, but it is one of the major factors. How important is the GCA interview at Google? I think I just addressed this. It's as important as any other interview. So if you're interviewing for a product management role, you're going to have a product strategy interview. You're going to have a full product uh, design interview. You're going to have a technical judgment interview or maybe system design. You're going to have a couple of behavioral interviews, understanding how you behave in the workplace uh, and how you kind of generally approach product management. And then you're going to have a GCA interview. So it is equally weighted to all of those. It is equally as important. Um, okay, my tips. 
Uh, okay. Monal has a question. Is there a way to know which interview is going to be GCA? So yeah, when your recruiter gives you your onsite panel, they usually tell you which of your interviews is GCA. It's, it's, it's like its own labeled interview. You don't usually have to kind of guess and check. Now, the caveat to that is that your, your, you know, interviewers might switch spots. So you might in your actual like day of interview, your, your GCA interview might move around to a different spot than you expected, but you will know which interview is your GCA because it will be labeled. And you can always ask the interviewer at the beginning of the interview, uh, what is the interview focus today? And then they'll, they'll tell you, um, they don't try to hide when you're having a GCA interview. And when in doubt, I tell people, um, if you're getting a question, you're like, is this a GCA question? It's usually like kind of a differential diagnosis approach. So if it doesn't start with tell me about a time when, or walk me through, it's not a behavioral question. If it is not a technical question, so explain how X works or walk me through the design of a system you've worked on or tell me how music streaming or YouTube streaming works, then it's not a technical question or a system design question. So if it's not any of those, then it almost certainly is a GCA question. But again, they usually reserve an entire interview for GCA. You're going to get multiple GCA questions and they usually don't stash GCA questions in any other interviews. Okay. Uh, another question about breaking, yeah, breaking down the question into smaller pieces. So I want to answer this in two parts. One is um, really understanding. I want to explain what they're trying to, like what the interviewer is trying to get in terms of signal from you. So they are trying to understand how your mind works. So they're trying to understand how your mind works as well as how much capacity you have cognitively. And so understanding how your mind works, they want to see how do you um, think think uh, about problems in a, in a big way. Um, so how do you, how do you expand, how, how expansive is your mind? So you want to kind of start your answer with an expansive approach. I'll tell you how to do this tactically in a minute. Um, but they also want to see how you simplify problems into reasonable solution spaces, how you synthesize data and information that either you're provided in the interview question or that you ask to, to get access to in the interview question, and also how you synthesize that, that with your own judgment, intuition, and experience to come up with a reasonable path forward. And so now I'm going to explain actually how, how you do that. So you definitely want to think about how you break the question into pieces as you start showing your simplification and synthesis abilities. But you want to start with expansive, okay? So the way that you do that is you start by asking clarifying questions. And these clarifying questions are in part your way of showing your expansive, like all of the factors that you can imagine are important for this scenario. Um, and they're also a way of helping you get information that will later help you simplify and then synthesize your, your response. So um, in the video that I'm going to launch on YouTube in a week or two about GCA, I actually give, I have myself answering a question about GCA and the question that I ask myself is, how should humans go about colonizing the planet Mars? So imagine you get this question in an interview. You're like, I've never thought of this before. Like, I've never considered. Maybe you have. I hadn't. Uh, maybe you have thought about how we should colonize Mars. But if you haven't, what we what you don't want to do is kind of start by freaking out and thinking, I don't know the answer. That, that's the whole point of GCA questions. There's no right answer. So you want to start by asking clarifying questions. Have we ever colonized another planet? Are there extraterrestrial life forms we have to worry about? Are we the only ones there? How much access do we have to basic nutrients, water, oxygen? Uh, how long does it take to get to Mars? Is transportation uh, going to be a challenge that we have to overcome as part of thinking about this? Um, do we have any experimental evidence that life can be sustained on Mars? Is this a permanent colony? How many people do we want in this colony? Is it the entire population of Earth? Is it a subset of the population? What are our long-term goals for thinking about colonizing Mars? And by asking these questions, you're showing your brain, right? You're showing your cognitive process. You're expanding the horizon, your own cognitive horizons and saying, how big of a question is this? How big can I, how big can I get here? And you've shown the expansiveness of your mind. And now it's time to switch into simplifying the problem and then synthesizing the answers that you get to those questions from your interviewer, synthesizing into a reasonable path forward. 
So it is a little bit about breaking it into smaller pieces, but it's mostly about starting big and then narrowing as you go. A few tips that I have around how to approach these problems. Um, first, change your mindset. So the first thing you need to do is, is, is put yourself, you, you've just come out of another interview where you did a system design question where you felt like you were, there was a right answer and you were being assessed on whether you were coming up with the right answer. For the GCA interview, I want you to switch your mindset from this person is assessing me to this person is my peer and we are going to solve this problem together. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to check in. I'm going to say, hey, did I miss anything? Are there any other questions I should be asking? Uh, are there any other factors I should be considering? Um, is there anything you want me to zoom in on? Is there anything you really want me to focus on? Here are the four things that I could imagine would be important for us to focus on. Which of these do you think I should focus on most? So you're really engaging them in the process as if they're a peer and y'all are figuring this problem out together. Um, the second tip that I have is around engaging the interviewer. It's kind of related to changing your mindset, but first you have to flip the bit on your mindset to say, okay, this person's a peer, we're solving this problem together. Now that I've got the mindset that we're, we're in this together, now I want to figure out how to actually engage them to get more information that I'll use in my simplification and synthesis process and also engage them to make sure that if I'm missing something big, they have the opportunity to give me that point me in a certain direction so they can get the signal that they need on the question and also so that it's engaging for both of us. And then as I already kind of alluded to, the key to these questions is really starting by thinking big, showing the expansiveness of your mind, and then moving toward simplification, which involves using the answers to those questions, as well as asserting your own assumptions. I assert that by the time we're creating a colony on Mars, that transportation will be at least 10 times faster. So rather than taking years to transport goods and people from Earth to Mars, it's going to take on the order of months. Um, I assert that we have an unlimited budget for this project. I assert that, or I'm going to make these assumptions. You don't have to say assert, that's a little bit nerdy, but you can do, you know, whatever. But the point is that you're making assumptions and you're stating them for the interviewer. And then you can say, hey, is there any of those assumptions that you disagree with or any assumptions, additional assumptions that I should be making? Um, that's the simplification process. So now you're making the problem more approachable. You've got unlimited budget. You can get things to and from Mars in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, the basic, you know, thing, the basic factors that sustain life are either creatable or already in existence. Um, and then, you know, the, there are no extraterrestrial life beings that are attacking you in the process, which would, of course, change the plan dramatically. So you've really simplified the problem to um, a smaller subset of considerations. And now you're going to go into the synthesis process where you're going to say, based on my assumptions and the assertions that I've made, based on the information that we've talked about, here are some of the main considerations that we need to think about as we think about colonizing the planet Mars. We need to think about uh, life-sustaining uh, resources. We need to think about uh, transportation. We need to think about growing the population. And we need to think about uh, basic infrastructure for uh, enabling that enabling that growth and then sustaining that growth. Um, I can dive into any of these four items. Which of these four do you think is most critical? I personally think that figuring out how to sustain life for our initial colonists is the most important thing to focus on. And then the interviewer can say, yes, let's focus on sustaining life. And, and, and you've really narrowed the problem down. So start talking to me about what you would do in terms of coming up with this plan to ensure that you can sustain the life of the initial colonists. Um, I'm a, on the video that I'll release on YouTube in, in a week or two, it'll really go through this question in detail. I just really like uh, explaining GCA questions is really hard without having an actual example to go through. So that's why I'm bringing this like Mars example into it. But hopefully, um, hopefully that was a helpful way of kind of thinking about how to actually use these tips around changing your mindset, engaging the interviewer, and then showing your brain by expanding and then narrowing. Um, hopefully that was a helpful kind of mini example. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, please type them in. I'm happy to answer them. Or if you have any other questions, um, my plan is to be live for as long as I can be helpful to, to y'all. Any questions you have about interviews, whether they're at Google or at other companies, um, any questions you have about you know, cognitive abilities questions, happy to answer them. I'm here for you. Other questions that people ask me about GCA logistics include kind of how long is the interview? It's 45 minutes. How many GCA questions can I expect? 
Um, depending on how much expanding and how much, you know, back and forth you have with the interviewer, it can be as few as two questions in a 45 minute interview. It could be as many as four questions. Um, and in general, in a 45 minute interview, unless it's system design at Google, um, you're going to get somewhere between three and five questions. And if you're getting fewer than that, you're probably not answering the questions concisely enough. The exception being system design, where you're really going to focus on one problem most of the time in that 45 minute interview. And then anyone can ask GCA questions. So the interviewer isn't necessarily like technical or non-technical. They're not necessarily senior or junior. It just really anyone can ask GCA questions. And some people like me really enjoy asking and receiving GCA questions. So um, you might find that like certain, uh, that there's no kind of archetype for who's asking these questions, unlike a system design interview, um, where you're almost certainly going to be meeting with a technical team member. Anyone can ask GCA questions. Okay, question from Monal. How much does general knowledge help in this? What if I have no idea about the topic? For example, I don't know anything about Mars and feel stupid kind of not knowing something like gravity. So actually, this is a great question because I, in my video that I made about this, as well as right now, as I was kind of mini walking through that Mars GCA question, I did not address gravity. Um, so so that is where the engagement with the interviewer really comes in. When I asserted assumptions about budget, about life-sustaining uh, resources, I didn't mention gravity. And so if the interviewer is particularly interested in how I'm going to ensure that people don't just fly off into the ethers, um, they might say, you know, one assumption I don't hear you talking about is managing uh, gravity. Can you include that in your in your answer? How you're gonna how you're gonna deal with that? Because it is it's a really great question, um, Monal, and one that uh, I did not address. And so then, of course, it is a it is a responsive interview. So they they want you to react to the feedback that they're giving you. And so it would then be on me to come back and say, okay, if we're thinking about gravity, we need to think about you know soil conditions, our ability to basically pin things to the ground as well as our ability to create a gravity-like environment for humans to be able to stay footed on the ground while they're in the colony, uh, walking around, whether that's in their homes and buildings or you know, walking around outside. Uh, we need to figure out how we're gonna create a gravity-like environment or some sort of tethering system that ensures that people can stay um, where they need to be. Also, I actually don't know if Mars gravity is higher or lower than the Earth, so I'm assuming that it's lower. I may be wrong, actually. Um, it might be higher. So if they have higher gravity, we might have to deal with other things like organ system compression and other factors that would affect human viability on, on Mars if gravity was higher. So um, great question. I think that the, the TLDR on this is you don't have to know anything. And in fact, they probably want to ask you something that you don't know anything about because they want to see how you react and your ability to reason through a problem you've probably never pondered before. And so if they give you if you if they give you a factor that you haven't thought about, you just, you just roll with it. Follow-up questions are notorious on GCA questions because again, as I said at the beginning, interviewers are looking for the boundaries of the problem. The boundaries of the problem in this case happen to be the boundaries of your cognitive abilities. So it can be really uncomfortable because they might continue asking questions um, they might ask why, why, why. They might ask how, 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 and kind of get you to continue narrowing, narrowing, narrowing until you're to a point where you're like, I actually don't know how to deal with organ compression in humans that is caused by uh, a gravity scenario that is outside of kind of the bounds of my current knowledge or ability to kind of think big and expansively. So there is there is a there is a time in the follow-up questions where you are going to feel backed into the corner of your brain and you are going to feel like I have nothing left to give. My advice to you is to not say that. <laughs> no, don't give up. Um, a lot of times people when they get to that point where they're just like, I don't know anything about organ compression, they kind of almost lash out in the interview. I want you to not do that. I want you to keep cool and I want you to explain what you do know. Um, when you get to that place, they will know when you're getting to the edge of your cognitive abilities, they are trained to understand this and, and they basically have to make a call on whether they ask another question or whether they've gotten the signal that they need and move on. Um, so they're still asking you questions. They're still trying to get signal, which means you need to continue giving signal, which means showing what you, what you are able to do with your cognitive abilities. So if you like in this organ compression example, I don't know anything about organ compression. 
But I will state what I do know. I do know that in various parts of the body, there is more volume uh, of space available than organs taking up that space. So for example, in the body cavity, there's a lot more space, whereas in the brain and skull, there's a lot less space. And so organ compression becomes a lot more critical, I think, in spaces that are smaller, especially if organ compression and decompression is a problem. For example, if someone's walking around in a high gravity situation and then they walk into a lower gravity situation, if that is a situation we're dealing with, we really need to think about how expansion of organs will become a limiting factor for humans, as well as if organs are being compressed, if that affects essential organ functionality. And if it is affecting organ functionality, we may actually have to make some changes um, maybe it's proactive uh, interventions, uh, surgeries, and other kind of interventions that help either restrict the impact of tissue growth or or, or contraction in these high gravity or low gravity situations. But I would really uh, want us to focus on is thinking about how frequently is the person going to be cycling from low to high gravity uh, conditions. How much do we believe the human humans will evolve, and on what time span to be able to handle? The gravity conditions on Mars. And for our initial colonists, is there any proactive or even reactive intervention medically that we can do to ensure that um, they're able to sustain life and they're able to live well um, in these uh, cycling gravity conditions? I know nothing about any of this, and that is my best possible answer, and there's nothing wrong with that. So really explaining what you do know, showing your synthesis process is what you're trying to do in these GCA questions, even if you get an endless supply of follow-up questions. All right. I don't see any more questions. Um, thanks uh, for joining, uh, especially thanks to Monal for asking lots of questions and KKID1108. Thanks for your question as well. I'm going to wrap this up now. Really nice to see everyone. I hope you all have a great Wednesday. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to post them. Um, it gives us ideas for videos. It gives us topics for next time. Um, and we also will think about moving moving this time to if, if we have folks that want us to, to do it at a different time. All right. I'm going to end the stream now. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a good day.